Good evening, good evening and welcome to St. George's House in Conversation. Uh, I'm delighted that so many of you are able to be with us tonight. Uh, and I do want to say, if in the course of the conversation, there is a question you'd like me to put to our guest, please use the uh, chat facility on Zoom and I'll do my level best uh, to, pick, to pick them up. Um, it's a great pleasure tonight to have as our guest a, a, a firm friend of St. George's House, uh, Professor Hugh Montgomery. Um, Hugh is Professor of Intensive Care Medicine at University College London. He's also the director there of the Centre for Human Health and Performance. Uh, Hugh is also a leading medical light uh, in the public health and climate change debate, and I'm sure that's something that we will very much touch on this evening. Interestingly, next week in Windsor, in St. George's House, we have a consultation on the very theme of uh, public health and climate change, generously supported by the Calouste Gulbenkian Foundation UK branch. Um, Hugh, it, it's a great pleasure to see you virtually, and I very much look forward uh, to seeing you in person uh, ne next next week. But we'll come to uh, climate change in a moment, but I thought I would start perhaps inevitably uh, with a question about COVID. Um, and what I wanted to ask you was, you know, we're all tired of it. We all want it to be over. Mm. Um, do you think we're being driven at the moment more by political imperative than scientific or medical expertise, have we learned anything over the last few years? And what's the long-term prognosis for dealing with COVID in our society? Wow, that's, <clears throat> that's a difficult one. And um, which order to take them in? I suppose there's no question that an awful lot of action in the last two years, and particularly in the last three months has been driven politically. Um, I don't think anyone listening to this would doubt that situation at all. Whether the decisions have ended up in the public health are really being the incorrect ones, I think is rather hard to know. I was certainly very concerned uh, as we saw such rapid lifting um, of restrictions around the Omicron time. And I was wrong. I, I was worried that we were in for a very savage, uh, life-threatening virus. And as it turned out, the South, Af uh, South African data were borne out. It, this didn't have those impacts that we were worried would be there, uh, in part because the virus has indeed mutated, and but in part because we have a, a very effective vaccination policy and many of us are indeed triple vaccinated. So that has played well. Um, I think there have been some problems, particularly with schooling. The, the very quick lifting has decimated, in some areas, the teaching profession. So the children seem to get through it all right and pass it around, but the, the teachers were then off. And I'm not sure that's been a particularly good thing. Um, the question, of course, is always raised, will this help because we'll reach this supposed state of herd immunity? Well, I think that's very difficult indeed, actually, and it's very hard to achieve with any coronavirus. Uh, the other four or five coronaviruses that are out there that affect all of us with essentially upper respiratory tract infections, a bit like common colds, we'll all know we don't really get herd immunity to those. The immunity we get from antibodies is relatively short lived. It's around probably 140 odd days, which is why we can all get two or three potentially colds in a year. Um, it doesn't stop it echoing around. And for this particularly highly infectious coronavirus, it's going to be very difficult to reach that level of, of, of herd immunity. Does it matter too much if it remains benign? Well, that's also a bit of a punt. Um, the narrative seems to be this sort of virus always just gets a bit more infectious and a bit less lethal or a lot less lethal, and it eventually just embeds itself as a, a more minor seasonal virus. Uh, there's no certainty that will be the case at all. And if it does occur, uh, to quote our chief scientific officer, the road to get there could be quite bumpy. So we may yet get um, a nasty variant polling up and hitting us again. There's no reason at all, biologically, why that shouldn't be the case. And it does seem that uh, this virus can hang around for an awful long time using humans as sort of giant fermenting bats, really, to create new and unpleasant 
versions. There, there's quite good evidence for longevity of this virus in a way that there isn't for some other viruses. So we're by no means out of the woods. Have we learned anything? Well, yes, of course, broadly, we've learned a lot um, about how to manage pandemics. But then you could point out that we knew how to do that before. Mm -hmm. The WHO playbook was very clear about what to do with pandemics of this sort, and it was locked down hard and fast. And Britain was not alone in singularly not doing that. Um, we've learned a little bit more about how to manage those things in hospitals. We've learned the value, I have to say, of a robust academic series of institutions such as Oxford University and Imperial and, of course, UCL. We've learned a lot about having a really good pharma base in this com com country, which has allowed us to do trials. We've learned a lot about the value of having an NHS. Three cheers for the NHS. I mean, yeah. of we, course. You know, I think it's reinforced that, but we'll come to it in a minute. I think there are an awful lot of lessons that we have failed to learn, um, yeah, which yeah. will come back and bite us in the future. Okay, and, and Hugh, what about long COVID and, and, and ah. progress on post-viral fatigue and all of that? Right, this is a real worry. Um, long COVID and post-viral fatigue, in my mind, need to be separated out because I'm not altogether sure we understand what post-viral fatigue is. There are Sometimes, actually, it's a dustbin for serious illness that's missed, and it's easy just to put it into that label. Long COVID is a very distinct thing. The virus is malevolent. It affects not just lungs and upper airways. It affects brains, kidneys, muscles, livers, hearts, um, renal tract, the genitourinary tract as well, menstrual cycle disturbances being common, and the blood and clotting and blood vessels. We know that a lot of patients get very long lasting effects and we don't understand yet what those are caused by. Some of them will be organ specific and they will be though very different diseases. So you could be breathless, for instance, because your muscle mitochondria aren't working or because your heart is not working or because your lungs are not working. And if your lungs are not working, I could give you five different mechanisms, at least by which the lungs could be affected by COVID. So I think for a lot of these conditions, it isn't one thing. And this is a real problem because we don't yet have the landscape to understand this. And if you go to your GP saying, I'm feeling exhausted and breathless, your GP doesn't know where to start. Mm. And actually, internationally, we don't know that either. What we do know um, from some excellent molecular biological work is there's a lot of people with brain fog and fatigue, which are really prominent features, do have very profoundly altered immune systems. This is even a year out. Very clear changes in, we know, 13 inflammatory molecules and probably more. Now, whether it's that inflammation that's driving, let's say, ongoing clotting processes or the illness, and whether the, that inflammation is being driven by the persistence of viral infection, for instance, we still don't know. So sadly, we're a long way off having treatments. But there are, I think, five major trials going on in the United Kingdom to try to resolve those issues at the moment. Right, right. And, and just you mentioned the NHS, uh, and of course, and the, the absolutely wonderful job mm. they've done. Um, but there is a knock on effect. I mean, just today, I was listening to statistics about prostate cancer. Mm. Uh, normally, in any given year, 58,000 people would be diagnosed, the numbers are down because mm. people aren't being tested. Have you, yeah. have you witnessed, you're at the chalk face, have you witnessed this difficulty with the knock-on effect? Absolutely, and it, this is something we need to learn. So in wave one, it was terror from the general public and probably quite well-grounded to not go near a hospital because they were seen as sumps of infection and they were sumps of infection. We've got you know, clear evidence that hospitals before we understood the contagion that it was, were exporting the disease. Um, the services then got completely locked down for reasons actually that are probably worth explaining. Wave one, it was all hands to the till, I mean, to the tiller. We, we were absolutely overwhelmed with this tsunami of very, very sick people with a disease we just didn't understand and we were having to crack it at the time. And we couldn't put cancer patients and elderly people and whatever else anywhere near those people. 
We're now in a slightly different situation, but we've got to remember that whilst we have far fewer patients with COVID, we still don't want to stick someone who's immunocompromised next to someone with COVID because it can still kill them. And it does. And we still see deaths in people, for instance, with chronic lymphocytic leukemias or who are immunosuppressed for organ transplants or rheumatological diseases. And what that means is you have to run a parallel track service. You have to have a pathway that's red for COVID and a pathway that's green for people without COVID. And that's more than synergistic in terms of the resources that it requires. So I think it has been a really big problem. Um, it's led to a lot of misdiagnosis in, because COVID is so pluripotential in the way it presents. Um, a colleague of mine died of lung cancer in a, another hospital, having been told it's probably long COVID for his persistent cough. It was very easy to start labelling these things as COVID when they weren't. And it will take a long time to recover from this. Um, but we can come to this later if you wish. There is a lesson about this, that a great many people who suffered from COVID suffered because of chronic ill health that's entirely preventable by changes in government policy. And we saw again and again that the worst affected were the poor. And the poor are affected for many, many reasons. They Sometimes the wrong genetics because immigrant populations had genes that predisposed them. They were in work situations where they couldn't afford, avoid the virus. They couldn't not turn up to public facing roles for their work. Yeah. They were living in crammed housing. Many families in many generations crammed together in housing where they couldn't avoid each other. And we know from um, extensive work led particularly by Michael Marbus in this country, these social determinants of health are real. Poverty tracks with all of the other major risk factors that kill you from COVID. And yes. that's a real lesson. A lot of these deaths could be prevented and going forward could be if we just change the way we view public I, I, health I, versus disease. Of course, and I hope and we will come come back to that. Um, interestingly, with some of the people you've mentioned there and some of the groups you've mentioned, they tend to be the anti-vaxxers. Um, what, what do you feel about that? I have to say it, it's very dismaying. Um, and the people who were vaccine hesitant or anti-vax, it's a very, very broad church. In fact, it's not one church at all. So we have people who refuse vaccination for every reason. Uh, it's because 5G is in the syringe. Quite how you stick an electromagnetic wave in a piece of plastic, I don't know, but there's that. Or it's full of chips so that Bill Gates can control you. Um, it's because God will protect you. You're challenging Christ if you deny the fact that he will stop you getting this illness or if you do get it he will cure you from it it's because covid was invented it's because the vaccine is trying to kill people of one race or another um there is a, there's a whole diversity it's being fed by poorly educated people in many cases or people with other political views i'm fairly certain it's being fed very deliberately by some people because i suspect that messing the british economy up in this way is advantageous to other external agencies. I've got no evidence at all to say that, but um, it seems strange the way some of these stories are propagated and so well shaped and, and seemingly well targeted. I have to say it's, it's mostly we feel very sad when we see these people die. Um, I've seen anti-vaxxers um, become infected, infect their families. I've seen those people on intensive care for very long periods of time. Um, and I try not to get irritated, but I think there are many people who do feel frustrated by two years of this hammering. And our nursing staff in particular have been quite extraordinary what they've had to take on here. And I think for them, it can be a real frustration to see this I'm continuing sure. tide of people who who could be protected so readily. Yeah, yeah, and we will come back to the NHS in general, uh, maybe a little bit later, but mm. I wanted to turn now, if I may, to, to climate change, which is obviously mm. an area of great concern mm. for you. Last November, we had COP26. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of hullabaloo in advance of it, how the UK was going to lead the charge and all of this. Mm. Uh, it was held under extraordinary circumstances. Uh, did you think, 
progress was made? Um, put simply, no. And it never has. There are reasons why COP26 was always, in my view, going to fail. And we saw the poor chair in tears at the end when he knew that it had failed. And the most simple way of putting this is that to, to get a deal, everyone in that negotiation, and it's well over 190 countries, all have to agree. But this is a bit like marriage guidance where two people have absolutely no intention at all of getting married. So if you look at the players in those negotiations, there are countries like Canada with tar stands, Poland with coal. Uh, you've got the Arab countries with huge oil reserves they want to get rid of. You've got Russia, which is pretty much entirely dependent for its economy on fossil fuels. It's interesting that number one on their risk register compared to number one on our national security risk register over here, climate change is in the top three, along with pandemics and cyber. The greatest threat on the top of the risk register in Russia is action on climate change. So there are many countries there who do not want to deal. And there's a lot of vested interest in that as well from uh, companies. So it was never going to deliver. Um, there isn't time left now. It, it's We're in for certain catastrophe now. We can mitigate it a little. Um, if we're quick. But let's just look at what COP26 said, and that was that even to limit ourselves to one and a half degrees, which will be catastrophic, because what we're seeing already is with 1.1 degrees, and we're locked in for thousands of years of progressive change, even if we stop emitting now. But if we go for just 1.5, which will still be terrible, yeah. we have to cut emissions 50% in a little over seven years. Yeah. 50%. That's a massive ask, and that's not just on what we do, it's in everything we procure and buy, what every business procures and buys. This is a huge ask even yeah. to get there. The sadness is that what's on the table from those parties, even if they enacted everything they've suggested they might do, which they won't because they never have, we don't get a 50% reduction, we get a 13.7% increase, and we bust through one and a half degrees, somewhere between four and 10 years from now. Right, right. Interestingly, and given this um, dire situation and disenchantment, this is what leads to things like Extinction Rebellion. Uh, and I've, right. I've had a very interesting question from one of our listeners, a teacher, mm. Anna Gret Finlay, whom you know, uh, mm. and her students will ask her, should they support Extinction Rebellion, civil disobedience, protest, people who are prepared to go to jail, basically, for what they uh, believe in. So if there was a doctor group um, mm. in Extinction Rebellion, would, would you be a member? Would you sign up to that? Well, it, it's interesting. So to, to play the um, biblical quote of paying to Caesar what's due to Caesar, I think um, it's not for me to tell people what to do. There is a doctor's Extinction Rebellion group, actually. Um, my personal view, and it is a personal one, is that I don't think there's anything wrong in those actions. We are absolutely down to the wire. And I think that's potentially if there is, is a feeling that this is too extreme and that people are taking actions that they shouldn't be. It's probably based upon a lack of understanding of where we're at. We are in such terrible situation and we're not talking about an existential possible threat to future generations. We're talking about threats to billions of people within only, matter, within only a matter of a few decades of now. If anyone here is under the age of about 50, they are going to be in trouble themselves if their child born today, uh, as in fact the AR6 working group, one of the scientists of that said, a child born today is going to be facing catastrophe by with rising sea levels, extreme weather events levels by the time they're 30. Um, yeah. We're really, approaching an end game now. And yeah. I'm not sure that there's anything that should be off the table. It's I haven't personally got involved in that because my, part of my ability to shape policy and so forth is because people are prepared to have a conversation if I'm reasonable. And if I'm perceived as unreasonable, which might be the view of some, then I lose my traction. So I've been careful to 
make sure that people will still engage in a, in a conversation, try to be respectful of those other views. Yeah, and, and Hugh, given the impact that you see this having mm. over the next few decades, will it be equal across the world or will it be once again the poor who get hit first? It's a, it's a good question. It, we, it was always the mantra that the poor would be hit first, the poor would suffer most. Um, to take the last bit of your question, or first bit of your question first, mm. everyone is going to get hit here. Everybody. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. Um, the first to get hit will be the poor in terms of, because they'll have the least infrastructure to be able to cope. But if we just take some simple examples from the quality scientific literature, we know that in coming decades, 19% of the surface area of the pop world that's currently inhabited by humans will be uninhabitable because of statically high temperatures. We know that large areas will be even worse hit because you have extreme weather events, as we're seeing already, the floods, the fires, the droughts, the famines, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you're looking just at static temperatures with 19% of the world's area currently inhabited moving, that's between 1.3 and 3 billion people migrating. And you just got to think what happens if you have a few hundred migrants moving into a country, let alone a few billion. If we look at the jet stream, it's oscillating. You've seen that. We've all seen it. We hear it on Radio 4. It's a particularly freezing winter because the jet stream's moved, or it's a particularly warm season at the moment because it's moved the other way. In the coming few decades, it's going to flip solidly north. That's going to drag with it this river of water atmospherically to dump on northern Europe. So we're going to see much more extreme weather, but it's going to lead to a profound and permanent drought in the south, south of Europe, including the whole of the Iberian Peninsula which will add to that uninhabitability of that territory and yet more movement. We've got sea level rise, which even at the rate we're getting at the moment, which is about a centimetre every two years, is going to displace another two thirds of a billion people. So there's no way that we in the Western world with our comfortable middle class lifestyles, many of us, will be in any way protected when there's no food supply and when you've got billions of people on the move. And we haven't even yet talked about um, the ice melt coming from, you know, Greenland, where it's already 1.1 million metric tons a minute from just one ice shelf, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yes, it, it will hit the poorest first and already is, yep. but none of us are immune from this. And, and what is the role of the public health sector in this? I mean, what, what can be done? What should be done? And how do you do it? It's an excellent question. Um, in, until 2008-9, believe it or not, there wasn't even a single mention in the negotiating texts of the COP negotiations of humans being impacted in their health at all. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Only a little over 15 years ago, there was no mention of it at all. It's been doctors and public health workers, and actually nurses across the disciplines, that have managed to raise this, saying this isn't just about a fjord, the odd tree frog and the odd polar bear. This is about humans. So oddly enough, a lot of the political action, if there is any that we're seeing, has indeed been driven by the fact that it's now realised to be an economic and human issue. Can we drive it? Well, yes, we can. And it's an interesting one. We've all got to do our bit, but we're all limited in what we can do. What we need is to find some leverage points where change at scale in one sector can trigger that in others. Now, the health sector, of course, generally has people of reasonably good intellect to be able to weigh things. And beneficence, most of us don't go to work for money. We go to work for the reasons that we want to help people. Um, and none of us would think it would be acceptable to drive drunk to work and mow down children at bus stops and say that's just a price of collateral because of the great work we do in a hospital. So I think the health profession gets this. And I get a very strong feeling that very soon we're going to see research charities, universities that research health, major NHS trusts, um, big pharma, health tech, just moving and not waiting to be told what to do. And if they do, that's OK, only 4.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. But if we change the procurement paths, that could change everything. So a cardboard box, a drug company has their drugs in, for instance, is probably made by the same company that makes cornflake boxes. 
And so these changes in procurement may have much greater um, impact. So I think with the moral imperative and the intellect within health, that's a sector that could move very fast and could act as a torchbearer, really, for others uh, to follow. Right. And interestingly, there, when you talk about procurement and changing that system, that, that takes me to the NHS. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's sustainability. Mm. Uh, you know, constantly politicians talk about reforming this, reforming that. They run scared of it, I think, yep. really, because it yep. is such a monumental ship to turn around, if indeed yep. it needs turned around. Yes. But is it sustainable? Is the NHS free at the point of care, uh, point of need, sustainable as we go forward? In, in its current mode, no. And that's clear. We have more and more old people with more and more comorbidities, with more and more that we can do, whether it's scans or drugs, and greater and greater expectation that those should be delivered. And we have a smaller and smaller group of young people paying taxes to support that. And every politician knows that. And it's the same for social care. This whole issue of this inverted pyramid, which I'm part of, I'm part of that sort of 60s generation that's now getting into my 60s. Um, it will tilt things. And it's not sustainable. It cannot be sustainable. The answer is obvious to many of us that work in healthcare. And in fact, I wrote an article with a lot of us at the sharp, spangly, expensive end, uh, myself in intensive care as a professor with two other professors of intensive care medicine adults, a paediatric intensive care doctor, a neonatologist, a professor of cancer, of cancer care, which is oncology, all saying you should stop putting money towards us and turn the tap off. Because we've got to remember that a huge amount of the disease that we currently treat is entirely preventable. COVID highlighted that, as you say, if we took away cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, obesity, lack of exercise, all of those things that clustered together to put people at high risk, we'd have seen far, far less severe illness. And those disease states are due to lifestyle factors. Um, now, the same would apply if you look at cancers, where we know north of 20% probably 38%, in fact, of all cancers are completely preventable, even now. And it's probably a lot more than that. Those are the known knowns that we could get rid of. Yeah. But Cardiovascular you, but, but, disease, it's one in five cases we could get rid of. Most res respiratory disease, it's nearly 70 to 80% that would disappear with lifestyle but, but preventable change. how? By lifestyle by change, change? Very good. So uh, by change, in my view, in public policy, what we've tended to do is um, hector the individual and say, you really have to stop smoking. You are drinking too much. You shouldn't do that. You're too fat. You should stop eating so much. You should take some more exercise. In fact, we know that that's incredibly difficult to do. Even with education, it's very hard because the drivers are much more powerful than knowledge. Um, so if you look, for instance, trying to eat a healthy diet, you can put out as many public health messages as you like about the benefits of broccoli, but you're competing with a massive budget of advertising from everyone from McDonald's and Starbucks and Cafe Nero or name your favorite person and the donut manufacturers and absolutely everybody else. And you know what? Those things all taste really good and you're never going to get broccoli defeating um, a Krispy Kreme donut with ease. The problem, of course, is the normal distribution, the bell-shaped curve. If you move that distribution one way, you get huge numbers of more cases. If you move the population distribution back, you get huge benefits. So, for instance, rather than targeting people with high blood pressure, if you reduced salt in processed foods by 8%, you'd save hundreds of thousands of strokes a year. So what we need is to make it easy for people. You can call it nudging if you like, but it's just simple stuff. We need taxation and public policies that make it easy to walk and cycle and pleasurable to do so, and difficult to drive a four by four that fills the air with particulates that kills people with asthma and COPD and lung cancer and Alzheimer's and so forth. We need a dietary policy that makes it harder and more expensive to buy these unhealthy things and easier 
to buy the healthier options. Now, these sorts of things will make us more secure in terms of energy and military security, in terms of agricultural security, but they'll also turn the tap off in terms of ill health. Mm -hmm. And that will mean we're not spending huge amounts of money on propping up people that are dying. Um, we will have those people still working and paying taxes, contributing to our economy, and everyone wins. But what we cannot do, um, to sort of use a mixed metaphor, is have our cake and eat it. If we continue to eat cake, um, we're going to run out of money to support the illness that's consequent upon it. Right. But I mean, I get I get the imperative and make things easier to do and to change. Mm. But aren't we always going to be at the mercy of the advertisers? Uh, and, and is there a moral imperative to take them on? You know, the well, mad men of the 1960s or the mad men and women of now the 2020s? I think it must be very difficult. Um, while things are legal and there's profit to be made, uh, and when companies legally have to you know, maximise the return for their shareholders, we're always going to get these things. It's a bit like if we talk about insulation in houses. Um, the basic minimum of insulation will go into a house that meets the building regulations. The way to deal with that is not to change the advertising to builders or to encourage them. It's just to say, here's a new set of regulations. It's a level playing field. Everything changes from here on in. And the same would apply indeed to food policy. It would be readily ready to do. Um, there's just a worry that there's an accusation of nanny statism or of um, impingement of a free market. But we've got to remember that there is no such thing as a free market. Yeah. We don't tolerate trading in child prostitution, for instance, or hard drugs. We don't tolerate those at all. And we do legislate for things like alcohol and cigarettes to try to change behaviours. Um, if we do want an NHS free at point of delivery, which I do because I'm in an age group now that's going to need it, I absolutely want it to continue then we have to change the way we do things. In fact, we'll come to it later, but these things all interplay. If you uh, what is essentially for health also turns out to be exceptionally good for the planet, and what's bad for the planet turns out to be exceptionally bad for our health. So there are some quick and common wins here for the environment and for us as individuals. Right. And I just wanted to take you back a step because I know you and I have had conversations before about end of life care. Yes. Uh, and that debate about assisted dying is now starting mm. to come back into uh, the mm. public square. Um, where, where, where do you stand on that as a doctor? Um, again, it's, it's a personal view. If you if you canvass a few thousand doctors, I suspect you'll get quite a lot of, of differences. Um, I do think we need to give a lot of thought to compassionate care in dying. Um, we do. Thank heavens, I and mean, it gets another fabulous part of British culture. It's the fact we've got this wonderful hospice system, um, which many countries do not have. Um, and a good death when death is coming, to my mind, a great deal better than the talk that you can get, for instance, on one of my intensive care units. And sometimes that's misunderstood. Families will say, you know, they will make a demand that their grandma will want everything, but they don't really understand what intensive care and everything means. It's a really ugly, ugly process. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got to, and it, you don't come out. No one comes out of an intensive care stronger than they went in, essentially. Um, on the issue of assisted or merciful killing, you might just call it. Personally, I don't see a need for it, um, in that we are allowed to make people comfortable from pain and psychological distress, and it's perfectly legal to do that, even knowing that that action may shorten life. So I can give morphine to relieve pain at a dose required to relieve that pain, which I know Will, cons will consequently mean that that person will not live as long. But my intention in delivering it is not to kill them quickly. My intention is to relieve the pain. Mm -hmm. From those that aren't inside a hospitalised system, bar the few people who are uh, trapped uh, in some other particular circumstances, most people, if they want to kill themselves, have very effective ways of doing that, and it doesn't have to be medicalised. So I don't want to trivialise the fact that there are people who are deeply distressed 
um, with permanent and disabling and sometimes progressive conditions. But I would like to think that we can compassionately relieve that distress, whether it be emotional, psychological or physical, um, without the primary intent being to kill someone. And I personally wouldn't want that boundary crossed because I wouldn't want there to be confusion in the minds of patients. Just as a moment, thank heavens, a patient doesn't have to wonder about whether they're getting the right treatment based on money, that I'm doing something to make money out of it or I'm denying them care because I'm trying to save money. That's another great benefit of the NHS. And I think the same ought to apply to know that we'll always act the best interest of the patient. There isn't a question that um, we're finishing people off. Yeah, and do you think, Hugh, there's a broader discussion to be had about death in our society? It's not something anybody wants to talk about. It's something we all have to face. Uh, do you think that that would be something that might advance the debate if people were a bit more frank about the fact? Very much so. Um, and I'm a victim of that too, I suppose. Um, as the church has you know, become more distant from the lives of many and faith has receded for many in the country, um, discussions about um, death and the meaning of it and what a good death means and what's, what's important in a good life have somewhat receded. I can't say I've got it resolved even for myself. I mean, I'm, I live in fear of it all stopping. Um, I suppose I was always like as a child, I never wanted the good things to stop. Uh, I am in fear of the process by which that might happen. Um, and I see death all the time. Yeah. If you don't see death all the time, it's, it's a lot worse. And I think we do need these narratives. Um, I was, as you may remember, actually, I think we talked about this some years ago, uh, I, before COVID hit, we were planning to try to open that conversation. Um, and the way I was planning to do it was with a, a concept I called the final frame, in that I was at the funeral of a friend who'd been a photographer, and she had no family, um, and a friend of hers had to arrange the funeral. And we were talking about her, her death, which was awful. I mean, she had the most awful circumstance that, of a terminal illness. There were no hospice beds. She ended up in terrible pain on an open ward, surrounded by people who were demented. She had the most awful, awful death. And it occurred to me that there might be a cinematographic or photographic way of thinking about this, which is for me to say to you, um, look, you know, the, the, life, the life of Gary is coming to an end. It's been a cracking film. It's had thrills and adventure and romance and comedy, and everyone's loved it. It's been a really long film as well, but it's coming to an end. And just as we fade to grey and roll the final credits, what do you want your final frame to look like? Now, that's a question most people can answer. They mostly would say, I don't want the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and I don't want Jaws. I quite like my frame frame to look a bit like the English patient or whatever. I'd like to, I see myself surrounded by my children with my dog on my bed in a little cottage in Cornwall or whatever. Once people have decided that, they have to understand they've got to fight for it because the system won't deliver that. Yeah. And when having a medical choice, and I say, Gary, I can give you another round of chemo, then the question might be, what are the chances of success? What does that success look like? Because if it's six weeks and I'm in hospital all the time, and I feel dreadful as a result of it. And it also denies me my final frame. Maybe what I'll do is get my family to take me to Windsor yeah. and sit with me with my friends around me and listen to some music instead but I think we all perhaps have to start thinking about that final frame and I don't think that's such a threatening way of having a conversation with your children or with your parents or siblings yeah how interesting how interesting yeah thank you that's a, that's a very very helpful um, answer and Hugh we're, we're, we're coming towards the end of our, our, of our conversation but I just wanted to go back once again to that question of inequality yes. uh, which I know is something that exercises you greatly uh, both in terms of the health sector generally in terms of climate change 
Mm. What what can be done about that? Well, I mean, this is a huge societal change to 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 redress that imbalance. It partly requires a little bit more knowledge across the sectors to get rid of political dogma, because I still hear it said by many, to me and to others, that poor people are there because they put themselves there and they just need to drag themselves up by their bootstraps. They need to get on the bike and get the job. And if they're fat, it's because they eat too much and they just they should know better and get on with it. There's been some very interesting studies for the genetics of poverty. And it wouldn't surprise you to know that of the 20 odd thousand genes we've got and the six billion base pairs and lots of variation, there are a lot of genetic variants that cause poverty. And we know what a lot of those genes are now. Some of them affect simple things like IQ. If your IQ is lower, it's harder to earn money. They affect things like creativity, uh, imagination, ability to see a way out of your problem, perseverance, these sorts of things. A lot of them are genetically determined. Now, the way we all are is determined by genes interacting with their environment. So let's just imagine that you've got two parents with a bunch of genes that means that they're going to end up with a much higher likelihood of being poor. So they are. So they're living in poverty and they have you. What genes are you going to have? You're going to have those genes. And now you've got the wrong genes and the wrong environment. You, you've not got the right genes and you're living in poverty where the schooling is unlikely to be good and your role models are likely to be poor. And the chances of you getting out of that are slim. We can't change your genes, but we can change your environment. And people look at me and go, well, Hugh, you know, you got where you got to because you worked bloody hard, et cetera, et cetera. And that is partly true. I have. But the only reason I could get there is because I inherited the genes from my parents who had a stable marriage, who put me through a good school. And I was put in an environment where I was encouraged to work and do that. And it seems entirely appropriate for me that I'm appropriately and, in my view, aggressively taxed to try to support others who are less well off. And that's not uh, a magnificent gesture. It's a selfish gesture. Societies that are more equal are happier. They're healthier. It's better for all of us if the playing field is a little bit more even. So, um, that's probably where I'd leave it, I guess, into polemic. But yeah. I do think we ought to consider a little bit more about why some people are poor. And also, rather than making them the victims by saying, here's the information, now act on it, change the way, as I've said before, that public health policy and, for instance, taxation works to make it easier for people to make the right choices that are also good for them. Thank you. And we're going to meet next week in Windsor, consultation on public health and climate change. What, what would you like to see come out of that vis-a-vis -vis the health sector? Um, is, it, I mean, is it a statement of unity? Is it a, a plan of action? Um, what, what would work best? Yeah, one word, action. We, we haven't got time to be debating anymore, and we haven't got time for second and third order questions. How do we get this message? How do we do X or Y? We need to be moving quickly to immediate action. Um, to use a patient analogy, you know, if you're life threatening ill and that your life could be taken in minutes and you're in the emergency department, we don't call a series of case conferences to talk about how to talk to your family and think about it. You act. Uh, um, and we're now in that situation. So I think what we need is to have made a decision to act. The, the, what we do is a really difficult problem. But we've got to have decided to start that journey, and that journey has to start next week. So I'm very much looking forward to the consultation, Gary, and I'm hoping that something really profound will come out of it, and that by Wednesday we'll be on a very different path than we started on Monday morning. I, ho I hope so. I hope so too. And, and, and Hugh, that's been hugely interesting and informative. I just wanted to finish with one of the odd facts that I have retained in my uh, memory, which I seem to recall at one point that you held a world record for playing the piano underwater. And I wanted yes. to check, do you still hold that record and do you still play the piano underwater? Um, uh, the answer is I still don't um, play the piano underwater. And in fact, for various reasons, uh, which I won't bore you with, it turned out to be a synthesizer because the obvious is true that if you drop a piano into the water, it stops working. Um, 
I should have thought about before I said I'd do it. Uh, so we were, we played a synthesizer underwater, actually, that's been built for us. Um, and yes, the record still stands. Anyone who wants to have a go, it's 110 hours. Um, but for lo- I do occasionally get phoned up or emailed by people saying, I'm thinking of a go at this. Could you tell me how to do it? And when I tell them, they very quickly say, I'm not, I'm not doing that. That's far too difficult. I'll do yeah, something think, else. If it's OK with you, I think I'll pass on that challenge. Well, have a go, Gary, you know, have a go. <laughs> very well. Hugh, thank you very much for giving us your time this evening. And, and as I said, I very much look forward to seeing you uh, in Windsor next week. Well, thank you so much for having me this evening. And again, I, I share your enthusiasm. I look forward to seeing you next week, Gary. Great. Thank you, and it only remains for me to say thank you to those of you who have tuned in to listen to us. Uh, it's always encouraging to know that so many of you are interested in these conversations. Uh, and I hope we'll uh, see you back at St. George's House in conversation before too long. But for now, uh, keep safe, keep well, and good night. <laughs>